Greetings, everyone. Welcome to our exclusive Global Leading Voices webinar campaign. We are delighted to have you join us here today. Please be informed that if you have any questions during the presentation, you may type them into the question box in your control panel. The presenter will answer your questions at the end of the presentation accordingly. Now, without further ado, we will turn the time over to our presenter, who will begin shortly. We are about to start this webinar. Good morning, good afternoon, a thank you for your interest in data protection. We are delighted to present this PCB webinar focused on the GDPR, e-privacy, ISO 27701 alignment. Next slide, please, Milov. About our agenda, uh, we will start uh, with the context, which is a global development of data protection and privacy. Nilov, David, and I will introduce ourselves. We will present key points of the GDPR and e-privacy legislations, as well as the ISO framework. And we will go into more detail on the concordance between GDPR, e-privacy, and ISO 27701. We will end with a question and answer session. At any time, you can ask your questions on the chat during the presentation. Next slide please. Global data protection development. Uh, this one, thank you. The global growth of data protection is taking place around three models, European, American, and Chinese, which are significantly different. However, seven trends are widely shared. One, Data protection laws will concern about 200 countries in the medium term. The reference is the European strategy, integrating data protection, electronic communications, privacy, and information security. The protection framework comes not only from legislators, but as well from supervisory authorities, courts, and platforms that collect data. Two, personally identifiable data are expanded, expanded that dramatically. Technical information such as IoT or indi uh, indirect identifier that may fall under privacy laws. Three, following the SRAMS2 decision, of the uh, CGU, European Court of Justice, cross-border data flows require additional attention. Four, transparency and choice becomes the basis for user control. Five, the beyond the law, organization, organization must meet reasonable consumer expectations. Six, Specific obligation apply to profiling and automated decision making. Seven, US laws have led the way. Data security and breach response obligations are more global. Nilov, can you please introduce yourself now? Next slide, please. Happy Wednesday, everybody, and thank you, Vincent. My name is Nilav Kar, and I have been in IT industry for almost 25 years. And then for the last 10 years, I'm doing auditing in multiple ISO standards. And you can see my ISO certifications here. I have a company which is uh, called PM Gain, and which is registered in USA. Uh, it's a minority-owned company, and through this company, we provide uh, PCB accredited certification, PCB accredited training, and also consulting in following areas uh, like GDPR, GLBA, SSPA, and also um, 
PM Game is a solution provider of Cloud Security Alliance. So you can see more of these offerings in my website, httpspmgame.net. Thank you. Over to David. Yes, uh, happy Wednesday as we're on a global audience. I'm David Parrish. I uh, reside in the UK. My experience comes, I'm a retired UK specialist detective police officer and for the last eight to nine years I've moved into the commercial industry. I have a company that's uh, called Coordinated Risk Solutions. I specialise as per this profile and slide and our company focuses on harm reduction, risk management, data privacy, data security focusing on practical solutions and realistic uh, and we are qualified and in ISO, ISO implementations, data protection officer certified by the University of Maastricht and have some other specialist in information. We focus mainly on uh, specialist realistic uh, solutions. We always look for a solution, not a problem. Thank you for your time. All right, Vincent. Thank you, Nilov. Uh, I'm Vincent Bureau, founder at uh, DPO Solutions. Uh, we are outsource uh, data protection officers and uh, chief privacy officers. Uh, we manage uh, compliance programs, privacy impact assessment, data protection impact assessments, ISO and NIST frameworks, privacy technologies in North America and Europe. Next slide, please. The general data protection uh, regulation. So this uh, so-called GDPR makes uh, accountability and uh, integrating principles that uh, uh, requires organization to put in place appropriate technical and organizational measures and to be able to demonstrate upon request what they have done and how effectively they have been. Organization, not data protection authorities, must demonstrate compliance with the law. Uh, these measures include documentation of personal data processed, protection by design and by default, documented processes and procedures for enforcing rights and responding to data breach. Governance including a data protection officer for initial compliance and operational compliance maintenance. In this area of accountability, ISO 27701 can be a great help under certain conditions, as we shall see. Next slide, please. E-privacy, electronic privacy. The privacy and electronic communication directive, in fact, directive 2002-58 EC, on privacy and electronic communication is a European directive on the protection of data and digital privacy. The privacy consists of guaranteeing the confidentiality of online communication and not only of your personal data. With the prohibition of interference in communications, calls, chats, text, video conferencing with the specific rules on calls, emails, text, and faxes of commercial nature, and especially cookies and other trackers. This directive was amended by Directive 2009-136, which introduced several changes, in particular with regard to cookies, 
which are subject to prior consent. Alignment with the GDPR, with a regulation on the protection of privacy and electronic communications, PECR, has been expected since 2017 and could soon result in impact for online marketing activities. Next slide, please, Nilov. ISO 27701 is a privacy extension to the Information Security Management System, ISMS. ISO 27001 uh, it specifies the requirements for implementing a privacy information management system, PIMS. ISO 27701 includes a set of privacy specific requirements, controls, and controls objective. The ISO 27701 standard has a dual perspective, individual risk and organizational risk. The main aim of the uh, PIMS is to manage all privacy risk to an acceptable and consistent level. This need to take into account applicable legal and regulatory requirements. It also needs to take into account privacy risk to the individual. Another aim of uh, PISMS is to demonstrate diligence and allow organization to comply with applicable data protection legislation such as the GDPR. ISO 27701 divides its main content into clauses five to eight, which sets out the additional requirements and extension to be applied to ISO, ISO 27001 and 27002. Next slide, please. An alternative to uh, ISO 27701 is another NIST privacy framework standard. This approach of the privacy uh, uh, framework is to consider the potential problem that individuals might encounter as a result of operating systems, products, or services with data whether in digital form or not, throughout the entire, entire life cycle. The privacy framework can be used in conjunction with the cyber security framework to manage the data security aspect of privacy risk. NIST privacy framework is not certified. Next slide, please. Pro and con for ISO 27000 series regarding compliance. The pro, ISO 27701 enables organization to increase uh, the maturity and demonstrate an active approach to personal data protection, the essence of accountability. The standard was developed with input from experts from data protection authorities, the French CNIL, and the Europe, European Data Protection Board. The proximity of the standards to the GDPR is materialized by the specific annex that maps uh, each clause to, of the standard to the corresponding article of the GDPR. We will go through it with uh, Nilov later. But uh, ISO 27701 is a global standard, not specific to the GDPR. The ISO 27001 and 27701 standards allow for an organization certification to a privacy and information security management system. Come. 
it is not a certification instrument for the GDPR as described in Article 42 of the GDPR. And the risk of confusion between individuals and corporate risk is a point of weakness. Nilov, would you like to introduce us to the alignment between GDPR and ISO 27701, please? Thank you, Vincent. And um, hi, friends. I will provide from my experience that I have done auditing and uh, consulting services for GDPR and also ISO 27701 um, auditing that I have done. And as you guys know, 27701 doesn't stand alone. It has to be based on 27001 certification. Um, so, GDPR has 99 articles and 173 recitals, so it is not possible to cover everything within this short time. But what we have planned is going over the major aspects of GDPR and ISO 27701 to show you what are the major overlaps and uh, comparison between them uh, to a certain extent to give you some understanding um, how they're aligned with each other and um, they're not different. They're pretty much addressing the same issue, which is the data privacy. So the data privacy acts were coming up in different countries and I think GDPR was the major uh, regulation that came up, um, which came out in European Union. And that was kind of the torchbearer of Data Privacy Act. Um, so I also realized that, and I also quickly put together this ISO 27701, and that, that was published in uh, 2019. So if you look at the standard, 27701 in Annexure D, they are providing a kind of uh, overlap, kind of mapping between the ISO 27701 clauses that Vincent was mentioning from Clause 5 through Clause 8, and also GDPR articles. But this is very high level, and it is very difficult to discern from here. Um, how you can align them together. Um, so as I said, every aspect is, um, is very detailed and very um, um, informative. So it will not be possible to cover all of them. So we decided to identify a few major areas that we'll, be, we'll try to cover in this short time. So one of the major areas that was introduced by GDPR was the data protection officer or data privacy officer. And it details what are the responsibilities of data pro protection officer in GDPR article 37 through 39. ISO 27701 has a similar requirement. And in that uh, clause 6.3, it, it says appoint person responsible for developing, maintaining, monitoring privacy program. So overall, uh, DPO is a advisory function. It is not a line function. And the person who is performing this function should be reporting to the top management. I'm not going into the details right now. Um, and if you have interest, you can request us, request PECB, and we can organize a specific session on data protection officer. Uh, another major area, which is privacy impact assessment. And as you will see, both in 27701, clause 7.2.5, and GDPR article 35, they're talking about data protection impact assessment. Um, this is a huge subject and 
uh, I would love to cover it in detail, and this is close to my heart. I have been a software developer, application manager, and I believe in documentation of application. So as you will see in 27701, it talks about data flow diagram, data map. So here's a diagram which depicts the data flow diagram, how the data is flowing through your system. You have to identify each and every data element in your system by creating a data dictionary and a data model, which is like entity relationship diagram to show which table is related to what table and what information is exchanged between them. So basically, you have to know your data, what data you are dealing with, uh, what level of PIIs you are dealing with, how they're processed, how they're exchanged, and even how that data is transferred from one place to another. So you have to basically come up with a system model. And once you know that system model, then not only the first time you create this application, but every time you make the changes, you have to perform a privacy impact assessment on that. Another major area is the privacy by design and privacy by default. And this is a very good concept. And if you understand the Japanese uh, um, word pokayoke, which is like uh, mistake proofing. So it is close to that. So which is what is happening here is right at the design stage, you are taking care of the requirement and reviewing the design and through your uh, designing principles and engineering principles, you're building those gates and uh, to check that you are not um, opening any port by mistake, which can lead to an unauthorized access or you're not um, using any hard-coded uh, password, uh, you know, that can create a problem for you. So there, are, it's a big subject again, and a secure development policy um, is a good way to go. The organization should have a secure development policy, secure coding practices, uh, so that the developer, the designers, they know um, the problems that can happen, they can preempt the problem and take care of them at the design level. Uh, you might have heard of uh, OASP top 10. Uh, so there are a few areas that are identified which, which could be a, a threat for any organization, right? like uh, cross-site scripting or SQL injection. So those are the things that also can be uh, taken care of at the design level. Uh, one thing just to let you know, it has happened very recently. Uh, Joe Biden, US president, he has issued an executive order um, on May 17, 2021, and that introduced a concept called zero trust architecture. And that is also kind of related to this, but it is more towards access control. Uh, another major areas which um, both the framework deals deal with it. Uh, one is the uh, breach notification. And in ISO 27701 in class 6.13.1.5, it talks about um, what kind of information that you should be storing. And in GDPR, of course, Article 33 and 34, it talks about, it actually specified a specific time period before which the breach should be notified to supervisory authority or the uh, data subject owner. Um, so this is a lawful basis need to be considered um, while processing the data or PII. And 
you should be taking consent from PII principles. Um, it should be based on the performance of the contract. And I'm not going into detail um, right now, but you can read it from the slide. Uh, international transfer is very important. And I just want to quickly uh, mention about a couple of things. One is the binding corporate rules, which is um, provided by GDPR. That is a requirement and that is helpful for companies doing business um, uh, in multiple countries, including European Union. And you might have heard of Safe Harbor, which is gone, Privacy Shield, which is also now defunct. But the good news is that European Union has come up with standard contractual clauses. It has been just published 4th of June, 2021, and that will be helping us in doing business uh, across the countries. Um, policies and procedures, there are quite a few overlap here between the GDPR and 27701. Uh, general data private protection policy is a requirement. Data subject access rights procedure, that is a requirement. Data retention policy data breach escalation process. So there are a host of policies and procedures that are required by both frameworks to be compliant with. As I said, I have been uh, practicing auditing for the last 10 years and I'm doing information security and data privacy audits for multiple registrars like DQS, BSI, SGS, and also PECB. And based on my experience, I have found the challenges that different companies face while they are trying to implement. And this is not the full list. This is just few areas that I wanted to highlight here. So one thing is I have found uh, people are still not understanding the difference between anonymization and pseudonymization. So anonymization is when you cannot retrieve or recreate the data uh, after you encrypt it. Whereas pseudonymization is you can reproduce, reconstruct the data if you know the key. So that's the basic difference between them. Uh, the, another concept, data controller and data processor, I have found most of the companies, they kind of confuse between them and um, they don't understand when they should be called as data controller and when they should be called as data processor. In a gist, I always recommend that uh, assess your um, business model and find out, are you controlling the data? Are you designing the data? If that is the case, then you are data controller, but if you are just processing on behalf of the data controller or on behalf of the customer, then you are just a data processor and your responsibilities, your liabilities will be much less than data controller. Another concept, data subject access request, that has come up and this is little complicated because um, if a data subject is asking to delete his data from your system, then it's not that easy because the data is connected to different tables, different processes. And if you just simply delete that, that can cause problem to your application. So this is a serious subject and needs to be considered, needs to be looked at very closely. Don't sell my information. That is a very, very good concept. Came up with CCPA, which is California Consumer Protection Act. And uh, every organization dealing with PII of a Californian uh, citizen has to have a this data sell, don't sell my information on their website so that the data subject can click on it and uh, in, uh, exercise their rights. Uh, backup policy for PII, that's a uh, difficult thing to exercise in the sense that um, 
these frameworks, they say you cannot keep the PII after your processing is over. If you don't need your need it for further processing, you should not keep that data. But if you're keeping it in a backup file, a lot of companies keep a one year of backup data. So think about that. What happens to that data? Erasing temp temporary files, that is also uh, something to think about. And shall not reuse deactivated or expired user IDs. Um, so that has to be built into your Active Directory, those policies, that logic, so that um, you're not reusing them. And of course, supervisory authority of member countries, a um, lot of companies don't understand that, that not it is not one supervisory authority, it is supervisory authority of each member country that you have to contact with if you are doing business in those member countries. Uh, for this short time, I could cover this, but in on any subject, if you have more interest, we can organize more webinars on this and help you understand those concepts. I will hand it over to David. Sorry about that, everyone. When you're doing the presentation, it's best to unmute your microphone when it's your turn. So uh, hopefully you can hear me. Thank you, Neelof. Thank you, Vincent. So I'm going to move on to the last part of the uh, today's session uh, and hopefully show that what uh, Vincent has given us a high level view of then Neelof's expanded it. We now bring it into that specific area of privacy and electronic communication. And whilst the slide says, and the GDPR, that privacy and electronic communication crosses over virtually everything to do with our daily lives. It's uh, brought it about now. So we're going to focus for this afternoon on the European regu regulation, the Privacy and Electronic Communications Regulation and the GDPR. But for those who aren't within Europe, and as uh, Vincent said, they're all very similar, whether it's European, Chinese or American. Yeah, so you can take this to your own environment or your own lifestyle. But the issue is that your PECA sits along data privacy legislation. They work together and they provide specific rules for how you use now what in essence is the Internet of Things, which is our daily lives. Most of it is focused on direct marketing, yeah? And it is the direct marketing element that you would see in your social media where you see the highlights of the big fines and the companies being fined. I'll use some quick examples from the UK later, yeah? And what you should be considering if you're in a marketing environment, a business development, or just routine looking at how you're gonna advertise yourself individually, you need to complement privacy and people's normal right to privacy and the marketing. They should complement rather than compete. And the problem is, Vincent touched on it, you may be very good and comply with PECA in marketing, but you will fail to comply with an element of privacy, i.e. the vice versa. So ultimately, the legislation is interlinked. Yeah. The key ones to remember is that data privacy legislation, specifically the GDPR, relates to processing of personal data, 
your and my personal data, your name, your date of birth, your address, things like that. And PECA deals specifically with electronic marketing and has rules on marketing, calls, emails, texts, and facts and cookies. The thing is, on which legislation is stronger, PECA would come first in Europe. So you've got to comply with PECA first, but then you've got to keep comply with GDPR and then other global privacy requirements. As, as Nilof alluded to, the Californian Privacy Act, that will be relevant in your own individual countries. It then adds the difference of marketing between business to business is different to business to customer and this is where people get confused because business to business traditionally is you're doing for example to my company email uh, it's not really a personal data process but if you were marketing to me as an individual there's slightly different rules so Electronic communications, what are they in silence? And I'm going to move quite quickly through some of these slides for, to allow us enough time for questions and answers. Uh, but I believe you're going to get these slides. Yeah. And I'll use this phrase a couple of times, silence of the legislation, which isn't sometimes a bad thing. Yeah. And the silence is it doesn't actually tell you what electronic communications were, are. The rules apply in different ways using different electronic communication techniques. Marketing rules, direct marketing, which comes up, and we'll touch on it when I get on to cookies, are slightly different to uh, marketing messages to other particular service providers yeah the basic concept is if you're going to communicate with someone whichever format make sure you consider PECA and privacy together yeah phone calls faxes texts video messages emails and internet messaging for example what you've got to remember is it doesn't and this is fairly critical because people get upset about it or get confused, uh, is it doesn't mean the content of your web pages. And there are various issues, for example, I bet no one on here has ever read the terms and conditions of LinkedIn uh, or other social media platforms that say you're not allowed to do marketing unless, yeah? So there's lots of things like that that need to be thought through. Uh, sorry, uh, Vincent, I was supposed to say next slide when I was moving on. Sorry about that. Uh, so let's uh, look at the similarities of data privacy and PECA. The key requirements in relation to marketing is You've got to ensure there's a law that says you can do it and lawful base. You've got to have a lawful basis for both direct marketing and using analytical cookies. And then you've got to be able to allow people, as has been touched on already on the Californian code, you've got to allow people to be able to opt out. Yeah. Uh, and you will have all come across where you get emails in the COVID pandemic where people have said, just to let you know, we're still open. And you're thinking, who are these people? I didn't even know they had my data in the first place. So you want to be looking at, can I opt out? Can I unsubscribe? And how? So to unsubscribe has got to be as easy and transparent as being able to subscribe in the first place, which is often a difficult 
scenario and where there's a lot of failing, which you can try yourself when you decide you don't want to receive an email and just test it by finding the unsubscribe. You've got to have a privacy notice and you've got to be able to pick and choose which marketing you need. Yeah. So linking up from what uh, Vincent and Neiloff have said, there's five pillars really that you need to link within your privacy and electronic communications. You're usually okay if you can have your article five, your processing principles. Why have you got this material in the first place? Your lawful basis, why are you using it? And then Article 32, which extends Article 5.1.F, is you've got to have suitable security. So if you're going to market people and you're going to keep their data on your database, you've got to make sure as a fundamental that where you're keeping it and storing it is up to date, secure, accurate, and you've got it correctly in the first place. So just briefly touching on lawful process, yeah, uh, you know, and it, this is the Article 5. You've got to, the how you're going to do it, you've got to document it. Neilov said documentation is important. And you've got to have a lawful ground to do it in the first place. Why are you doing it? Yeah. So I'm going to move on now. There's a quick infographic that you can have a takeaway. But I'm not going to touch on it or go through it because it's already been done. But to achieve it all, you should have, wherever you are, but a, a good comprehension of whatever's in this slide. It, it translates across privacy, security, and marketing. Uh, so I'm just going to go into, and I know we've touched on it. This is an example of where marketing goes wrong. Papa John's pizza delivery company was collecting people's data when they went to collect a delivery or had a, a pizza delivered. Yeah. One, they'd done that and they'd obtained their email or contact details or whatever. They then started to market those people for special offers. Yeah. What they had failed to do is actually ask those people, do you want to receive marketing? If you do, we will tell you that on a Friday, there's two for one pizza. And on Tuesday, you can have four for one pizza. Yeah. So they didn't have a privacy notice, but they were just using soft opt in. They were saying, You've brought from us. Yeah. You've given us your detail to collect your pizza, and now we're going to market you. Yeah. What they should have done is they should have looked at consent. Yeah, and they got fined because they didn't do consent. Now, in some scenarios, you can have a legitimate interest and you can market people as long as you're giving them the option. So if you want to market someone to say, hi, you bought a car from us five years ago and this is the latest model and we think you would be interested in the new model of car because you change your car every five years, you have a legitimate interest. So that would be okay as long as you've got the option to unsubscribe. So it gets quite technical. So moving on, I've covered this again, the silence of the regulation. It doesn't tell you exactly what consent means. Uh, and silent again on this next slide, and I've got to move a bit quickly here because I'm conscious of time. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't tell you what clear and comprehensive information means. 
Uh, I've touched on where the regulators look at, and you can read this yourself and you'll find this at any regulator's webpage where they'll tell you what they're finding. Uh, so I, there's three considerations uh, that Vincent covered. I want to just speed on a bit to get to cookies, which is now, uh, Vincent, can we, uh, Nilov, can we skip to the cookies? Sure. Yeah. Uh, this one? Yeah, that one. Uh, so I'm just going to look at cookies, and I just put this slide up that everyone loves a cookie, and we all live with cookies all the time, yeah? There's generally two types of cookies, and you'll have this every day. Every time you go on a web page, it'll pop up and say, do you accept cookies? And because we're all busy, we all go, accept cookies, yeah? And then we wonder why 15 minutes later, we suddenly get an advert arriving about something. This is all about cookies. And there's two types of cookies. There's the technical cookie that has it makes the web page work. It's the engine of a web page. Yeah. And the second one, yeah, is the one that is the non technical or analytical. And this is the one that's in the media all about Facebook and all the other platforms. It's about they're telling you, uh, do you click on this button if the button exists? And do you really know what you're accepting? Yeah. So when you look at it, I've taken the ICO's guidance, the UK regulator, and this is what it says you must do on the left hand side. And this is a piece of work I did on a law firm, like this is a law, a big law firm, national law firm, yeah, on what was their website before the GDPR. Yeah, as an example. So moving on to the next one, it's the same website and it says you've got to apply cookies to, and the rules apply to third parties. So as, as Nilov touched on, this is about parties that are, you know, are using your website to maybe market their own products happens quite often and just if you did ever click on select your preferences or see what an analytical cookie looks like it would look something like this yeah and that's the information that you would see and the issue here is that when you look at them on web pages the retention periods of how long they're keeping your information is normally preset. So you can have your information that you visited that web page being stored for 100 years, 900 years, yeah? And all these different cookies. Now, to go through that to select preferences is very hard, yeah? So moving on, because I'm a bit over time, yeah? This is current media. We've touched on this. Schrems and NOYB are privacy advocates, and they basically say most web pages do not comply. Yeah. And if you want to test it and see how you sit, there are various website checkers uh, that show, and I've picked the European Data Protection board and then the last slide and I've literally taken the front of their page so if you logged on if you logged on to say they have a web page compliance checker that you can download there's others on the market I would always recommend as I would with anything go to a credible one because there's free ones on the market that maybe aren't as good. So when I say credible, 
do some due diligence on the free product that you are going to use. But this one is quite clear here, and you would expect this, where it says your options, no thanks, only technical cookies in the middle. So that's a good web page. So I'm a little bit over, so I'm going to quickly give my conclusions on the last slide. Yeah. So I specialize, my company specializes in coordinated risk management focused on privacy and security. And I use this acronym for team. Yeah. You need everyone together. Everyone achieves more. You can't do this by yourself. Yeah. The, the wheel tells you that you've got to look at privacy, basically for individuals, and security generally for business. But you can't do one without the other. And this is all of the things that we've talked about today, starting with Vincent, then Neiloff, and hopefully we've brought it together because you must need leadership you've got to have someone owning it you've got to understand it assisted implementation means you're going to need help training and my but my big thing is keep it simple ask yourself why are we doing it how are we going to do it and who's going to do it don't overcomplicate it and you will be safe and secure thank you everyone i was a bit rushed i apologize hello thank you, thank you vincent nilov and david for delivering this very informative and detailed webinar uh, pcb offers training and certification courses which will show your dedication in implementing and managing privacy related frameworks and most importantly you will get recognized worldwide now we'll go ahead and take some time to answer some of the questions from the attendees regarding today's topic. Uh, so the first question is, in the, uh, in the area of information governance structure, where does the privacy or data protection officer sit in relation to a typical certified information security officer? Um, this is Tilov. I can take this. Uh, the Vincent and David, you can add on to it. So. Um, the data privacy officer, the difference between chief information security officer and data privacy officer, the primarily chief information security officer is the line function who is responsible for implementing, managing, monitoring, and improving information security management system within the company. And data privacy officer, his role is to oversee that is the company doing the right thing? Are they processing the PII in, in a lawful manner? And the data privacy officer is also the link between the supervisory authority and the organization. It's kind of in jest, and David and uh, Vincent, if you can add to that, I'll appreciate. Vincent, do you want to go first? Hello? Hello, Vincent. Are you on mute? Ah, sorry, I was on mute. No, let's, let's go, David. Let's go. Thanks. Um, so, following on from what Neelof said, the difficulty is we've given names and titles in the internet world, particularly as it's evolved. But Neelof's right. For data protection officer uh, in regards to privacy, that is a specific role which should have independence, relevant training, skills, and be able to go to the board with confidence yeah. and say, you need to stop this until we have considered people's privacy. Exactly. It becomes a bit of a conflicting role which Neelof and Vincent have touched on, when we get the business pressurizing the new IT, the new software, 
the new more efficient thing and they then come to the data protection officer or the privacy specialist when they've already made the decision to buy the product in essence yeah and oh by the way uh, you have to figure out whether you really need a dpo uh, and if you are large scale operation and you're dealing with um, uh, pii's uh, serious information then it is by uh, regulation gdpr you have to have a dpo and not necessarily you have to have a dedicated person the dpo may have other functions as well and mm -hmm. dpo also a lot of organization like mine provides dpo as service uh, whereas chief information security officer it is not a requirement by gdpr or by iso standard albana uh, thank you. Uh, the next question is how to maintain compliance with the increased number of data protection laws and regulations worldwide, and how does ISO 27701 help in GDPR compliance? Um, okay, so Who's first? Uh, okay. Uh, so, uh, like I said, I mean GDPR is kind of the torchbearer in the world on the Data Privacy Act. And because they imposed a lot of penalties and all, so every uh, organization was thoroughly rattled and uh, tried to become compliant. But they were not finding any standard or you know, framework which they can get certified and claim that, hey, I am kind of compliant now. So like that's why I said, I also considered this situation and came up uh, with this certification pretty quickly. ISO 27701. But uh, if you are certified ISO 27701, that doesn't mean that you are GDPR compliant. So 27701 is an overarching data privacy framework, uh, you may uh, say that. And that helps you, that, that framework that is, that is guiding you, that is helping you if you practice all the clauses that we have talked about, class five, class six, class seven, and class eight. eight class seven and class eight, it depends whether you're a data processor or a data controller. And that will reasonably, will take you to a position that uh, you are practicing processes, having policies uh, that will help you in becoming compliant. But there are some nuances which are very specific to GDPR or even for the member countries or the privacy acts of other countries. Like for example, I mentioned that uh, data breach notification has to happen within 72 hours. That is a GDPR regulation. And uh, ISO doesn't prescribe any such things. David? Vincent, you go. Yeah, I, I would like to first come back to the uh, previous question regarding DPO because this is something we know quite well like deep, at DPO Solutions, uh, uh, my company. So it's very important just to outline uh, what uh, David uh, and Nilov uh, uh, you mentioned, but it's uh, I think very important to mention this is a, a GDPR definition article. 37, 38, and 39. So, and, and this is a benefit of the GDPR, this definition, because it helps a lot. Uh, there is a requirement and mandatory situation, as uh, Nilov mentioned, but anyway, this is really, really useful to have a, a DPO when uh, you do process uh, European personal data. Uh, because this is simply the uh, one of the main, maybe the main uh, way to manage compliance and to demonstrate compliance, which is accountability. So uh, now, if you don't, and if you are sure you don't have any uh, European personal data, uh, the chief privacy officer. Uh, will uh, will uh, have the same kind of uh, uh, governance position as the uh, CISO. Uh, the difference, David explained it very well, 
is the status specific GDPR status of the DPO with this uh, independence by status. Regarding the uh, the ISO uh, 27701 and uh, the the uh, interest for uh, an organization, uh, first of all, you can get certification of on the standards, not on the GDPR. This is really important to understand it. But as well, you can use this framework like the NIST uh, cybersecurity and privacy uh, framework. You can use this ISO uh, 27001, uh, 27002, and 27701 uh, without any uh, certification objectives. And it's still a good uh, uh, tool. Second point is, uh, it's very important for me to understand that this is a privacy extension to an information security uh, framework. So from 27,001 and to, to 27,701. And on the opposite, privacy in the in the in principles in the definition of the gdpr in definition of the uh, 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 of the international organization uh, uh, principle uh, is include uh, the security a uh, security principle but this is only a one seventh let's say one seventh of the privacy principle so information security regarding privacy standards, international standards, is only one part of it. So the ISO framework is a, a, a kind of another perspective. Uh, of course, this is uh, uh, really uh, because of the, uh, uh, of the market of the 27,001, uh, uh, which is very big and for some country, uh, Angria, Israel, uh, for example, but others. Uh, this uh, information security framework is really important. This is uh, one of the main uh, uh, tools uh, for uh, demonstration of uh, 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 security measures right now. So this is why uh, this is a very good move from ISO to propose this, but at at the same time, this is very important to understand that this is not uh, a pure <laughs> privacy approach. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Okay, due, to, due to time limitation, uh, this is uh, the last question for today. As a multinational with a single website and presence in many countries, will it be required to have a multiple privacy notice policy for each country? considering that there are slight variation on privacy laws in these countries. Do you want me to go with this one, Albana? Yes, yeah, sure, David. Okay, so this one is a good question because we've been talking here and picking up with Vincent and what Nilof has said. ISO, ISO standards complement your wider business yeah and if you go with those frameworks they're in the title they say international standards you can then work with your organization to go so the answer to this question in my perspective is if you follow that your web page is transparent you are reasonable in what you're saying you're doing with people's data and you have someone who's accountable or something to enable people that to turn around and say, I don't want you to track me. It doesn't matter. If you've got one good policy that doesn't have to be 20 pages that no one reads, it can be a page that says, we use technical cookies. This is to keep our web page. But our other cookies do this, 
And if you don't want our other cookies, click here. So the simple answer is you don't need multiple privacy notices. You need a good privacy notice that is transparent. Anyone else? <laughs> thank you, David. Thank you, David. Okay, so thank you once again, uh, Vincent, Nilav, and David, again, for presenting today's topic. And thank you, everyone, for attending today's webinar. Please be informed that this session will be recorded and posted on our website and YouTube channel, along with the slides of the presentation. For more information about our webinars, please visit our website, www.pcb.com. Thank you all, and stay safe. Thank, thank you. you. Goodbye, Goodbye from England. Bye, everybody.